We take no particular joy in reporting this, but facts are facts. The Ontario Liberals sustained the worst electoral defeat in their 151-year history a week ago tonight. Just seven MPPs in a 124-seat provincial parliament is all the grits could muster after winning four straight elections. What does this once-proud party do now to become relevant, or is this a more existential crisis? Let's ask. Two candidates who felt the sting of defeat last week, former St. Catharines MPP Jim Bradley and former Burlington MPP Eleanor McMahon. They're joined by University of Toronto political scientist Sylvia Bashevkin and the Globe and Mail's features columnist Adam Radwanski. Good to have everybody around our table tonight. Uh, I do want to start with the two MPPs. I may spend a mm -hmm. little time over here. We may do a little therapy here, uh, folks, <laughs> on this side of the table. Jim Bradley, you had your last caucus meeting as a Liberal MPP yesterday. How did that go? Uh, it was a sad day because many of us would not see each other again, perhaps uh, in our lifetime, or at least not very often. And there was a feeling that many people who had served very well were not successful on that evening. So there was a good deal of sadness, but uh, there was acceptance. And it was interesting that there were comments about how democracy works. Uh, that, that was overall saying that, you know, the people have spoken, and in a democracy, the people are always right. And those of us who are the elected representatives or candidates must respect what the electorate has decided. So there was a serenity about that as well, but a considerable sadness because of, uh, of our good friends losing their seats and not seeing one another. Eleanor McMahon, you have been a cabinet minister for the last two years, so mm -hmm. you went to a cabinet meeting yesterday as well, the last one. Mm -hmm. How did that go? Surreal, I'd say. Um, you know, the privilege of being in that hallowed room is that Jim knows only too well is very, it's a remarkable privilege. And so when you realize that, that um, you may never see the inside of that room again, it's, it's daunting and again, it's humbling. Um, we had a good discussion, both in caucus and cabinet, I thought. It was civil, it was thoughtful, it was, uh, there was some reminiscing, there was a little bit of what might have we done differently. Uh, but there was also a good deal of discussion about what's next and where we go from here. And, and a realization that, as Jim said, there's a serenity to realizing that the voters have spoken. And there's a humbling uh, realization that it's now our turn and our opportunity to, as other parties have done, who've um, you know experienced similar defeats, uh, sit back and uh, discern exactly what the voters were telling us, what we heard, what what we did and didn't do, to ensure that we won, and take that away and rebuild. And that's what we need to do. Uh, can you tell us what election night was like for you, knowing? I mean, you pretty well knew you were going to yeah. lose, right? Yeah. What's that like? Um, well, it's it's um, it's it's disappointing. It's disappointing because on several levels, because in my particular instance, I wanted to continue serving my community. Burlington has a number of considerable challenges. I thought that I had uh, worked well in my community, delivered on behalf of my community, worked, done all the things that I, as a public servant, think are important. Working mm -hmm. well with city council and the mayor, working well with my federal counterpart. And at the end of the day, it's not about any of that. No, it's not. It isn't about any of that, as yeah. it turned out. And and. While people said to me, both at the door and that evening, Eleanor, it, this isn't about you. Uh, this wasn't about you. You did a great job. You delivered well. But this this wasn't about you. And bigger forces at play There's here. a sense that there's bigger forces at play, yeah. Jim Bradley, you know where I'm going next. Look at the monitor in the studio, please. Can we please bring up this graphic? The all-time MPP time spent in office at Queen's Park is Harry Nixon who served from 1919 to 1961, that's 42 years and two days. Jim Bradley is in second place from 1977, the 9th of June, you just passed the anniversary, until 2018, which gives his tenure 40 years, 11 months, 29 days, Farquhar Oliver in third. Mr. Bradley, you know that had you won this election and served 13 more months, you'd have been the longest serving member ever. And I want to know how disappointed you are that you're not going to be now. Well, no one will ever believe me when I say it. That I never thought that was a, a great accomplishment, and I on, honestly did not want to go ahead of Mr. Nixon. I would be happy to win the election, but I talked to Bob Nixon uh, just earlier this week. This and, is Harry's son. Uh, yes, and I said, uh, yeah. said, uh, uh, you know what? I, one good thing about it was your father 
remains as the longest serving member and deservedly so because he played a much more significant role in Ontario politics than I would have played. So uh, there wasn't a great... overly modest of you to there say. Wasn't, but there wasn't... A, a, everyone thought that and hmm. even as I say it today they'll say, well, he's just saying that. <laughs> no, I, I, that was not a consideration for me. The only time I would know about it is when there was a tweet coming from a fellow by the name of uh, Steve Pakin. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I'm perhaps genetically overly interested in this kind of stuff, but okay, we'll take you at your word. Uh, okay, you folks on the other side of the table, let's get into some discussion now about how the Liberal Party gets relevant again, because clearly they aren't today. And Sylvia, let me throw the conventional wisdom out there and then let's all weigh in on this a little bit here. The conventional wisdom is Kathleen Wynne took the Liberal Party over the last five years and whatever, 16 days, way too far to the left, away from the Ontario Liberal Party's traditional middle-of-the-road ground, which has it has occupied uh, for much of the last, well, you could go back even, say, 30 years. Does this party, to be relevant again, need to move back to the middle? Well, I think there certainly is an internal party debate that we've heard about. Um, Moving to the middle um, might, you know, might be helpful, but I, I, I think the party shouldn't lurch to the right. So I would say that if I, I look very closely at um, uh, the uh, interview that uh, Premier Wynne gave as a leadership candidate to the Toronto Star editorial board in 2013, she said she would be a collaborative, fiscally responsible social justice premier, which led voters like myself to believe she was going to move the party more to the center and left than where Premier McGuinty had the party. But, you know, I think a lot of people who are, you know, centrist and more, more progressive were disappointed that early in her term, she really was not very much a social justice premier. And there's a lot of data that suggests she wasn't all that collaborative. For example, the Hydro One privatization opposed by many more voters than supported it. Um, she was slow to act on escalating house prices in Toronto. She was slow to act on reforming some of the party fundraising uh, practices. She didn't allow Toronto to impose congestion charging. And to the extent that the party went left most recently on things like pay equity and childcare, that's only in the last few months. So I think there are probably a fair number of voters who thought, look, if you promise to be a social justice premier and so much of what you do before January of 2018 is actually more to the right than it is to the left, then where, where, where are you on promises? And if you look um, at the tenor of the legislature, I looked at ejections from the legislature and the use of time allocation. Actually, premier, during Premier Wynne's tenure, if you control for time, she was using uh, time allocation more and there were more ejections. Time allocation is basically closure. Basically closing closure, off closing stuff. off debate. So that's not collaborative. And so, you know, you could argue that relative to Premier McGuinty, it was actually less collaborative according hmm. to those measures. Okay. So I think those are some of the problems. Lots to chew over there. Adam. Hmm. It's interesting. I mean, there, that, there is that common perception that uh, they went too far to the left. If you talk to some of the folks who ran this campaign for the Liberals, and I suspect uh, Premier Wynne herself, although I don't know that, a lot of them would say that they actually think that they should have gone left sooner or stuck left after the previous election, that that was her more comfortable ground, that she was better at it, and that when they were doing things like the Hydro One privatization or talking about uh, deficits, that was not really her strong suit. Now, of course, we'll never know how that would have played out. Um, but there will be people certainly arguing in their party that they should actually stay to the left. There will then be people saying, look, the NDP is there. Um, they now have more seats than us. Um, why are we going to try and occupy the same ground as them? and pushing to go to the center. I guess the interesting question that I don't know the answer to is, is there much of a center in Ontario anymore? Like, we've seen in, in elections all over the place, not just here, um, pretty strong shifts, a growing degree, I think, of polarization, um, a degree of kind of anti-establishment sentiment, and the center tends to be kind of the most establishment of, of anything by nature. Um, is there a way to kind of tap into that somehow um, while still being kind of in the center of the spectrum, or are they actually better off trying to stick on the left? <coughs> Let me come over here. Eleanor McMahon, if I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times during mm. the campaign. Why do we need two socialist parties in Ontario? Yeah. For whatever reason, people saw, a lot of people mm. saw, the Liberals and New Democrats occupying the same ideological territory. Did the Ontario Liberal Party stray too far from its traditional middle-of-the-road self? Yeah, in answering that question, I'm going to build on something that Adam said, because I think he's quite right. Um, as we look at this election, and even leading up to the election, because... Um, I think there's a whole argument about how, how much elections matter, really, because um, going into this election, we faced a significant uphill battle. Did we lose the election? Of course we did. Did we get a resounding um, kick to the curb? Yes, we did. Um, were there uh, 
uh, steps in place before the election that were part of our undoing? Yes, there were. And so there's some complex factors at play here uh, that in 29 or 30 days uh, played themselves out in, in some very interesting ways. And yes, there were some, some pieces to that that, that, that intervened. But uh, to build on Adam's point about where the left is now, I think that's a very interesting point, or sorry, where the centre is now. Mm. Where is the centre? Where is the ideological centre? Well, that, Ford, uh, Doug Ford's closer to it than you guys are. Yeah, I think that's what I heard over and over on the campaign. Yeah, I think, I think there's some truth to that, although uh, by whose definition? I mean, who's defining what that middle ground is now? And I think as, as Liberals, we were focused on a couple of things. Number one, building a just society. What does that mean? And putting the um, instruments in place for people who, as a consequence of the last recession, still felt as though they'd been left behind um, in an economic shift that was global in nature, and we saw that play itself out in Ontario with the loss of some manufacturing, et cetera. So mm -hmm. when we looked at the future for people and wanting to ensure that in their daily lives they that the government was there to look after them, we very much uh, ideologically placed ourselves that government and the Premier said this often, and I agree, exists to play a force of good in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that, as she did, and as we did, and we positioned ourselves in that context of building that better society, um, you know, what does that mean? It means that the polarization that Adam spoke of, which is very much in play and global in nature and has to do with forces beyond us, like um, populism, and people's pocketbook preoccupations uh, that really, I think, predominated this campaign much more than we might have realized. Notwithstanding that we, uh, the campaign, sorry, the um, uh, the economy right now is extraordinarily sound. I think we had a role in play in in in, in creating those conditions, and yet. Um, people's uh, everyday pocketbook preoccupations predominated. How many P's can I put in that sentence? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Bradley, let's get your take on that. Well, I think I would uh, <clears throat> certainly concur with Eleanor as to, had to say. One of the things I kept saying to caucus over a period of time was that we can't forget <laughs> the people mm -hmm. who are attracted to populist candidates. Uh, they have their struggles as well. And very often they will look and see governments or the elite, where they consider all of us who would be sitting around this table to be the elite of society, making decisions that really don't take into consideration what their needs happen to be. Mm -hmm. And this anti-elitist feeling that's out there mm -hmm. is pretty prevalent. Mm -hmm. And it, we saw it working south of the border. We've seen many books written about it now, many columns about it. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we all have to consider. How do we tap into the needs of those individuals. How do we remember it? I used to refer, and I have on this program, to the Golden Pheasant Tavern in St. Catharines. <laughs> Dear a, Departed. A mythical place. <laughs> Actually, it did exist, yeah. doesn't today. But as, as people who don't necessarily follow politics on an mm -hmm. everyday basis, and they may not even watch the agenda, believe it or not, but there are people who have needs out there. Mm -hmm. And they look at those of us who are the union leaders, the business leaders, politicians, people in the media as being not in tune what their needs happen to be. And I think parties are going to have to address that. Uh, centrist parties will certainly have to address that. Mm -hmm. And I, I really don't know if there's a future for centrist parties. If we look around the world today, they're not very prevalent, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Europe or it's Asia or it's mm -hmm. uh, North America, more than South America. People are shifting one way or another. That may come back at some period of time, but it's not easy to identify today. The inference I draw from your answer is that you did feel that your party did vacate whatever the traditional center has been, did move left, and I wonder how comfortable you were with that ideological shift. Well, I was personally comfortable with that ideological shift, I can assure you of that, because on many issues uh, of social justice and uh, issues which affect the <clears throat> everyday lives of people, uh, I felt that we had a role to play, government does have a role to play in that regard. I know there's some people who think that government is evil, you should uh, cut back on government and so on. I'm not one of those. I think the government has a central role to play and that government has to make significant investments uh, that are going to benefit the public. So uh, I was not uncomfortable with that, but I know that there were others who were, and uh, we have to take that into consideration. Can you read that, that thing? What was that description that Kathleen Wynne said she was going to be? Uh, as, a, as a leadership candidate, Kathleen Wynne promised to be the social justice premier who would demonstrate a collaborative, fiscally responsible approach to government. That's the second part. I, that, that's what I want to hone in on. Because having put the books back into balance, maybe not according to the Auditor General, but according mm -hmm. to the Ministry of Finance, mm -hmm. 
The Premier in her last budget and the Liberals in their last budget then said, okay, we balanced the books, now we're going to go back in a deficit for the next seven years. Do you think there was a disconnect there between her original pledge and the way she governed? I do think there was a disconnect, and I think particularly on fiscal responsibility, we're looking at people who are trying to balance their own uh, books at home, mm -hmm. and we know that that fiscal responsibility would have been a very helpful asset for Premier Wynne, as would not privatizing Ontario Hydro, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I think that this uh, government... Um, Hydro it, One, you mean. Hydro One, sorry. That the um, possibility of re-election, at least to a minority, would have been possible. We know that uh, much of the um, uh, conservatism that underpins right-wing populism is social in nature. It's the people who are out there on sex education and the people, quite frankly, who are uncomfortable with women in positions of responsibility and with sexual orientation um, minorities in positions of political responsibility. So I think had the liberals been more uh, able to uh, pursue an economic responsibility platform, they could have vacated the social conservatism to the progressive conservatives, as they have often at the federal level to the uh, con federal conservative party. And that would have allowed them, I think, to, to hold some of that middle ground. Um, but it was very hard to make that case, mm. given the Auditor General comments. Mm -hmm. Adam, I want to follow up with this. We, we learned in the last federal election, this is already mm -hmm. 2015, so a while in the rearview mirror, that the one thing the Liberals got right, we know this from polling, is that deficits just didn't matter all that much at that time. Mm -hmm. And Justin Trudeau was prepared to run deficits, mm -hmm. and it didn't hurt him. Might have helped him, actually. Mm -hmm. Would you say that in this campaign, having balanced the books, the Liberals made a mistake by offering to run deficits for the next seven years? I think they looked inconsistent and a little desperate, so I think that was a problem. I don't know that people in great numbers voted against deficits. If they had, I mean, Doug Ford did not run very credibly yeah. uh, against deficits. But he played, um, but he, at least he paid lip service to balancing the he books. He did. Mm -hmm. I just, I mean, if we look at what people were actually annoyed about, though, I think it was more, <laughs> much more uh, around energy. I mean, that seems to have been um, the issue that even though that seemed to have leveled off a bit when the Liberals uh, reduced people's energy bills a bit out of the tax base, uh, somehow the campaign seemed to trigger it again and remind people of how annoyed they were about it, um, which is less kind of a left-right issue other than the, the Hydro One privatization and more, I think, sort of a not being in touch with, with people uh, concerned, which, which I think Jim was alluding to. Um, the sense of salaries. talking down. Mm. Hydro One salaries, yes. I think that continued to hit the Liberals throughout the campaign. The $6 million man. The $6 million Let me man. follow up on that with you, Eleanor, because the I, 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 this is probably two or three years old, this tweet, but I still remember it to this day. I don't remember who tweeted it out, but, mm. but the government of Ontario made an announcement that you are now able to... Renew your OHIP card, health insurance plan, without indicating a male or female as a gender. Mm -hmm. uh, because many people self-identify more fluidly as it mm -hmm. relates to their gender. And it was announced as a, you know, a kind of a great moment of social justice in the history of the province. And I recall somebody tweeting in saying, isn't that just great? Meanwhile, my electricity bill just went up 200% last year. Mm -hmm. Was that a disconnect that that your government never got its head around? I don't know if it's a disconnect. I, I think that both of those things are possible at, at once. If, if I heard correctly in the Premier's um, Toronto Star editorial board interview from her leadership campaign, being the social justice Premier was part of that. It's, it's not a silver billet issue. This is the largest economy in the country. This is the, the largest sub-national in the country. And it's a complicated job. And it's not a silver bullet issue on just about anything on any given day. So, so it's not mutually exclusive. You can be a social justice premier at the same time as you are an economically sound premier. And I would also hasten to add that um, while um, there are some criticism about our fiscal probity, um, we weren't the only party in the election. All three said they were going to go into deficit. Four. So, Greens too. Yes, Greens as well. So, so as Adam points out, I, I didn't hear much at the door, to be honest with you, about that. Although I did hear it more than I did the last campaign, which tells me that there is a growing preoccupation with that. And I think it ties into, if I may, Steve, I think it ties into something that I saw, and I'd be interested in Jim's thoughts on this, is that people seem to be moving away from this notion, again, of government as a force of good in people's lives and and the size of government um, and what's that going to cost them in the future. I heard from more people, oh yeah, childcare, that's great, but what kind of debt am I leaving my children? And and that from uh, middle of the road people, not just so-called conservative people who started to be preoccupied about that. And I think that's really interesting. I think that speaks to the fabric of our society and people's preoccupations. 
and maybe something that we missed. We were so busy creating that social justice framework, putting the, the pieces of government in place to help people in their daily lives and help them manage the economic forces that were overtaking us globally and the people that were left behind and the future nature of work, that we didn't maybe pay close enough attention to people's immediate needs. Let me ask Jim Bradley about that. That yeah. balance between wanting to you know, encourage social justice while at the same time being fiscally prudent. Did the balance get missed somewhere along the way? It, it may have, and, and to this extent, there were a lot of people out there who felt that our government was preoccupied, in fact, mm -hmm. with social justice issues, mm -hmm. as they would refer to in the hinterlands, the downtown Toronto issues, and that they were not thinking of what other folks out there were saying. Eleanor made reference to the fact that when you're, when you're talking about these kinds of issues and people are struggling yeah. to pay their bills, they're more concerned about that and wondering why the government would focus on those kinds of issues, which the government justifiably did, and there were a lot of good things done, but that was an impression that was created. But the other thing you mentioned, Steve, that I think was very significant, symbolically and otherwise, was the partial privatization of Hydro One. That most people in the province feel that Hydro One or these kinds of utilities should be in public hands. Um, now that we're no longer in government, we can talk about some of those uh, discussions. I adamantly oppose that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, my, my feeling as uh, most of the public would, that that should be in public hands. Uh, but second, I knew that politically it would not be well received by most of the people in the province. When you made that argument in, in cabinet and caucus, I presume, uh, what kind of pushback did you get? Uh, there was not a positive response. Uh, <laughs> people listened. How diplomatic. They, 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 <laughs> people listened, uh, but they didn't necessarily they hear what I was saying on that occasion. Uh, Do you think you had, was it more than just you inside that cabinet that were opposed to that? It would be. Uh, I, I, certainly there were more than, than a few of us who were concerned about. Some were apprehensive, some were adamantly opposed. I thought that could be a turning point for our government. Uh, a lot of liberals were very concerned when that announcement was made. Because you remember, Mr. Clark's first advice was not to sell any of Hydro One. Mm -hmm. Then he came back and said we should. This is Ed Clark, the uh, Ed Clark in this bizarre. particular case, yep. the, the, the guru uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we listened to at that time. And governments have to be careful as well. I don't, I don't want to sound anti-elitist now. But governments can be caught up in listening to gurus. And what happens is uh, the general population mm -hmm. aren't on the same wavelength. And the general population sometimes are right, and the experts are not always right. Mm -hmm. It may have been a, a decision that, uh, that was certainly made some sense in terms of getting money for government. But let me go back to one more thing, Steve, at the risk of, of uh, prolonging this. <laughs> and that is, no one wants to pay more in taxes. Yeah. That battle was lost in the 1990s. Yes. So governments are looking for ways to get money without raising taxes, yes, yes. whether it's uh, you know, different fees that they will charge or privatization taking place. And someday, we're going to have to sit down as a society and say, if we want all of these services, which we believe we need, then we're going to have to increase taxes to do so. But let's find a party that'll ever be elected saying that. Gotcha. Uh, let's just spend a minute here on whether or not, Adam Radwanski, you think that the rules ought to be changed at Queen's Park to give a party with only seven seats, official party status, when we know that the threshold right now is eight. I think probably in the long run they should be. I mean, I think that party still has a pretty strong voice. I, I think, as others have pointed out, the fact that the Liberals were not eager to do that for the NDP when they when, when, when those roles were reversed um, means that the NDP will probably try to obstruct it, and understandably so, and it's certainly their interest to do so. I think it's a really interesting decision for Doug Ford, and not just on that, but also on the on the per vote subsidy that currently exists and whether to do away with that, as you said. Um, with the Liberals, although they would get the least of it of the three major parties, um, they're going to need it the most uh, in that they're deeply in debt and their fundraising is going to be really bad. Mm -hmm. um, he has to decide for himself, um, does he want to try to keep a sort of divided uh, center-left? Uh, you would think that's in his interest. You would think so. There's other Tories who think kill the Liberals, they win elections, the NDP doesn't, the NDP brand is worse, let's just go against them. Um, so there's going to be a real debate, and, and the people just don't like the vote subsidy from their perspective. So there's a real debate, and he's going to have to decide how much does he want to try to keep the 
the Liberals alive, which is, by the way, a terrible fate for the Liberals. Of all the, of all the people in whose hands they'd want their future, Doug Ford is possibly the, the last person. <laughs> well, I do remember 10 years ago that there was a discussion in the McGuinty government about whether or not to give the NDP official party status, even though they didn't meet the threshold. And I seem to recall there was an MPP in the Liberal caucus at the time who said, I think we should, because you never know, someday we may be there too. Mm. Mr. Bradley, who said that? Mm. Uh, guilty as charged, so we say. <laughs> that, that was you, I thought and so. I think we have to recognize that what goes around comes around in all yeah. these cases. But there was also a case to be made for it that the New, New Democratic Party had in fact gained a lot in terms of the popular vote. You have to, mm -hmm. I think you look not only at the number of seats, but the popular vote. Mm -hmm. If we look in, in, in the proportional representation, for instance, in Europe, uh, it, it kicks in at 5% or whatever they happen to have in that country. So I think we have to look at that as well. And the Liberal Party in this case got somewhere around 20%. So I think there's a case to be made, just as I thought there was a case to be made when the Democratic Party wanted to have that. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, it is, it's a sense of fairness but one always has to remember that what you do will be remembered by those who are hurt by it. And they are remembering today. I don't expect anybody at this table to say at this early juncture, here's who I think ought to be the next permanent leader of the Liberal Party mm -hmm. to bring them back to the, you know, respectability. Mm -hmm. But those conversations are going to start to happen, Eleanor, very soon. Yes. And yes. the fact is, John Fraser from Ottawa looks yes. like he's going to be the new interim leader, interim leader yes. in the uh, legislature. Mm -hmm. Just share some of what you're talking to your colleagues about, what you're thinking yourself, about what kind of a person you need to lead this party permanently going forward. Boy, that's, we could have a whole show on that, Steve. Yeah. I think and if you have a name, you can share it. Yeah, I, I don't have a name right now. I think, and I, I, I believe this, I'm not just spinning here. I, I think that it's our first task is to, is to digest what happened, to um, unpack uh, what we need to do differently, what we can learn from this, um, result and uh, and figure out where we go next. And we have to do a lot of talking and a lot of listening. Um, I don't want to give away caucus secrets, but I can tell you that part of the discussion yesterday, which was pr productive and passionate um, and very civil, um, was uh, listening is something that if all governments aren't careful, especially as you get longer in tenure, uh, you can in very real ways forget how to listen to people. And I think if there's anything that we take away from this defeat or this lesson is that listening to people is something that you can never, even if it's at the golden pheasant or <laughs> elsewhere, uh, listening to people is critical. So before we think about who this can be, and on a very practical level, Steve, we're in debt and we need to get rid of that before we think about having any kind of leadership convention, a leadership uh, also allows you to raise money, which is helpful, and puts you out there in ways that are important and can get more, more people. We need to call the Liberals that left us home again. And so what, who, who that person is, is interesting. I also think we need to think about social media and uh, women in leadership and what that meant. Mm. We could have a whole conversation yep. about the premier and the dismantling of that and the websites and the social media campaign that was waged against her and what that meant for the future of attracting really good people to public life. A lot of women are going to shy away from it, I can tell you, not just women, but particularly women, after what we saw during this last campaign. You refer to the yeah. curse of female leadership in the country, which is Indeed. no female premier has, has ever been, been re-elected. Re That's yeah. right. You're about to have a book published on this. Yes. You want to weigh in? Uh, well, sure. I mean, there's, a, you know, there's an unfortunate pattern whereby particularly progressive women leaders are very targeted in social media. Do you think that's why Kathleen Wynne lost, though? No, I don't think that's why she lost. I, I, I do go back to points about being collaborative and social. But did that play a role? Did I her gender and her and her sexual orientation, do you think, play a role at all in the debacle that was last week? I, well, you know, I think over time that the debate over sex education often became a kind of uh, proxy for uh, people's comfort levels with women and sexual orientation minorities mm -hmm. in positions of responsibility. But to go back to the larger question of where the Ontario Liberals go, I think there is an important need to bridge the rural-urban divide. Yes. Uh, one of the things that Ed Clark said uh, in promoting privatization, I believe he told the Toronto Star, um, was that it would help in particular rural, um, uh, rural uh, hydro users because it would bring the discipline of the market. Of course, many rural hydro users are the most adamant about the fact that they feel that they've been gouged yeah. by high rates. We also see that there were lots of people who thought that the Liberals were pandering to downtown Toronto voters. But I live in a downtown Toronto. See, it got an unprecedented NDP 
uh, member elected. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are all kinds of people in downtown Toronto who feel like the Liberals left them. Well, is it fair so, enough, Adam, to say that that the next leader is always the opposite of the previous leader, right? So uh, Kathleen wins two Toronto, so is the next leader of the Liberal Party going to come from the suburbs or the exurbs or rural? And if she's a woman, does it have to be a man? And is it, I mean, do you know what I mean? I hope they don't think of it that way yeah. because yeah. the pendulum does correct itself, and, and not just in the Liberal leader, but look, I mean, Doug Ford is a correction of sorts to Kathleen Wynne, and the next premier will be a correction of sorts to Doug Ford, but we don't know what that correction is. Mm -hmm. It could have been somebody who ran really fiscally conservatively and was, was primarily focused on getting the books back in order. Instead, it was more of a kind of a stylistic correction, more of a mm -hmm. um, somebody who people wouldn't feel was talking down to them, um, that kind of thing. Um, somebody who's anti-elite. Um, we don't know what it'll be. I think what you really need is just somebody who has a strong identity. Um, it, we've seen, you know, people seem to value authenticity in, the, in their politicians yes. right now. Mm -hmm. um, they need somebody, and frankly, the, the next leader is going to set the, the course for the party. I mean, that's what leaders do right now. Um, you know, the federal liberals obviously lucked into somebody or, or were lucky enough to have somebody mm -hmm. who was able to revive them. Um, they can't, the, the Ontario liberals can't expect somebody of uh, quite a Justin Trudeau's level of, of sort of a generational candidate, well, but somebody who at least has a strong enough personality that they're able to take a lot on their shoulders, I mean, they're going to need. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, yeah. You go back to the previous leadership convention and you find out who came second. That's what always happens. Mm -hmm. Sandra Pupatello came second last time, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bradley, in, in January of 2013 in Maple Leaf Gardens. What would you think if the Liberal Party were led by her? Uh, she was a, a very good candidate, a very strong candidate, very uh, likable individual. I don't know whether she has any interest in pursuing that. She uh, says she has no plans action. to have plans. We've heard that, that before. Uh, that is Bill Davis <laughs> saying. I can well recall that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that, uh, she would certainly be a very serious contender uh, where she decide uh, to do so. But I think one of the things we have to look at uh, is that if you look at the, the book called the political, uh, the political Brain, it talks about people being attracted to leadership candidates emotionally as opposed to intellectually. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at that with all leaders. Leaders have to be likable or if not likable, distinguish in a, in a different way, uh, sometimes exactly the opposite, either not likable at all, but very much respected or very likable. So the Liberal Party will have to look carefully at who the next leader is going to be. I think the suggestion that there be a bridge between uh, urban Ontario and rural Ontario is very important mm -hmm. because we have been divided for some period of time. And that's not unique to the province of Ontario. That's across North America, if you look at it, mm -hmm. that, uh, that divide. We have to start bringing people together. That's not easily done because what attracts some candidates, uh, is attractive for some candidates, is not attractive to those in another part of the province. While you have the floor, you were here a year ago. I don't know if you remember this, but it was almost exactly a year ago you were here talking about 40 years in public life because you'd hit the 40th anniversary mark. And when I asked you about whether it was worth it to spend 40 years of your life in public life, here is what you said. Sheldon, go. Probably, and this is very dangerous, I always tell people, but probably from the time I was a little kid, I wanted to be a member of parliament. It was in a grade five class, and there was a municipal election at the time, and I just took to it. The teacher was teaching that, as our kids do today in grade five. And after that, I thought, this would be something of interest to me. So I have never thought of anything else, uh, although... Uh, if I did, perhaps a sports announcer or uh, something of that nature. Maybe the Sabres need a new play-by-play -play guy. Uh, that's right, or a new general manager, something oh, like that. Okay. Yeah. You don't want that job. That's no. a killer of a job. That's uh, one where you're, it doesn't last 40 years, I assure you. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are now able to take that Sabres GM job if you want it. Oh, Do you yes. have anything to announce today? I have nothing to announce in that regard, but I will have more time now to uh, pursue my sports interests, which you know are great. Uh, I'm uh, both locally and, I must say, uh, internationally even. I enjoy sports very much. Uh, so who knows what uh, could uh, be in my future there. Let me ask you another weird question. Frank Miller was a Premier of Ontario. He then went on to become the, the regional chair in Muskoka after his premiership was over. Uh, you know, John Quincy Adams was the President of the United States. He then went on after he lost to become a member of the House of Representatives. Question, is your political career over? I have no plans to have plans for <laughs> my political future. <laughs> so is it feasible that you could, in four years' time, try to become the uh, Liberal nominee in St. Catharines again or run for something else? One cannot predict the future easily because yeah. when one does, uh, it's played back on TVO. <laughs> <laughs> what a cagey answer that was. Okay. All right. Um,
Hey, I got some tape of you too. You ready for this? Because oh, oh. you were here okay. four years ago yeah. after you had won your mm -hmm. election, and we're one of you're part of a show we did here called The Rookies. That's right. And um, okay, let's see what you had to say then. Okay. Sheldon, go. <laughs> So please complete, Eleanor, to you first, the following hmm. sentence. Wow. My time in public life, however long it lasts, will have been worth it if I manage to, what? If I manage to, uh, to make a difference in people's lives, if I manage to um, create a prosperity agenda for Burlington and bring jobs and prosperity to Burlington and enhance the quality of life, and potentially on a broader scale uh, as a parliamentary assistant in my current role, uh, make a difference to the people of Ontario. Okay, that is the benchmark you set for yourself four years ago. How'd you do? Wow. Um, I think I did well. I'm proud of what I accomplished both in Burlington and beyond. As I said earlier, it's a tremendous privilege to be in this role and have this opportunity. There used to be only 107 of us. There's now 124, I guess. Is mm -hmm. that right? Um, and so when you think of it in that context, it is a privileged opportunity. Did I bring jobs and prosperity to Burlington? Yes, I did. I'm glad I did that. I, again, would have loved to continue, but people spoke. Um, did, I, did, I do, um, did I do that on a provincial basis? Yes. I mean, I think you know that one of the reasons I came to public life was because I had a tragic loss. And my husband was killed by a careless driver in 2006. I amended the Highway Traffic Act three times in his memory. The Premier asked me to invest in cycling across Ontario. I did. We invested $100 million in cycling. And as the current conversation in Toronto and elsewhere moves to road safety, vulnerable road users, uh, I passed a law in Greg's memory last December uh, to address that gap in vulnerable road users. And so I feel as though I, I took that opportunity. And, and because of some very smart and helpful people along the way, including the Premier who gave me the opportunity, I was able to make a difference. And I'll always be grateful for that. And the $100 million that I invested in cycling across Ontario, I will never, no one can take that away from me. And I feel very privileged about that. And I hope that I've changed people's lives and made it safer for them. Nice. Thank you. Do you think your political career is over? I don't know. Um, I think the, uh, the party has a very bright future. As funny as that sounds, I'm an inveterate optimist. Steve, Do you want to be involved know. in that? Uh, I need to think about that. I think one has to be asked in these opportunities, and someone needs to knock on your door and say, we think there's a role for you. And, and in that context, if there's a role that I can play, I have already told my colleagues who remain as elected representatives of the seven, the magnificent seven, as we're <laughs> calling them, uh, those seven representatives in, that are going to be the face of our party in the legislature. But they don't stand alone. There are millions of Ontarians who, who are Liberals and consider themselves Liberals, even though they might have voted differently this time and we need to bring those people home. And so if there's an opportunity in that context for me to play a positive role, I'd welcome that. Gotcha. I want to thank all of you for coming around our table here at TVO tonight and sharing your views. Jim Bradley, the former MPP for St. Catharines, number two on the all-time list of time spent at Queen's Park. Eleanor McMahon, the former MPP for Burlington, president of the Treasury Board for... A couple of more weeks anyway, until the 29th of June when the transition takes place. Sylvia Beshevkin from the University of Toronto, Adam Radwanski from the Globe and Mail. Thanks so much, everybody. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.